All right. It looks like we've got our participants online. Hello and a very well welcome. This is another event of our executive leadership series. My name is Clemens Kovnatsky and I'm the Associate Dean of our full-time programs. It is my distinct pleasure and a great honor to introduce Lindsay Costigan. Lindsay, welcome to the club here. Thank you, great to be here. Lindsay is a fellow alum at Pepperdine and she's currently the head of our Western region prime finance sales at BNP Paribas. That's a mouthful there. Um, prior to that, she had an executive position at Deutsche Bank, at B of A, Wells Fargo in the hedge fund research division. So welcome Lindsay and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much. All right, so maybe we can start out by um, looking into your career a little bit and, and maybe you can tell us how did you get from Pepperdine all the way up to BNP Paribas, that's the French bank. Uh, maybe you can chime us in and tell us how that happened. Absolutely happy to. So ever since graduating from Pepperdine in 2007, I've been working in banking and for large banks. So first of all, in research, both long only research and hedge fund research, doing primary research on hedge funds. So real on the ground due diligence. And after that, I moved to the sell side. So investment banking back in 2011, where I made a bit of a career pivot by moving into hedge fund financing. So I, I like to joke at dinner parties that I'm, I'm really doing God's work selling leverage to hedge funds. So over the last decade, I, I spent a majority of my time in a role called Capital Introductions, where my role was to really help my hedge fund clients grow their business. So everything from investor introductions to product growth, uh, to marketing, consulting in a way, and that really helped me figure out the role that I'm in today, overseeing the financing business in the Western region for BNP Paribas, where my role is to sell financing to hedge funds. So whenever hedge funds need any leverage, I need to be their first call. My, my territory historically has been Texas West. Excellent, thank you so much. So could you give us a broad overview of this industry? Because hedge funds have this very strange sort of public image. Um, some of them don't even hedge, right? So what is the industry that you're in? Uh, kind of broad level overview. Absolutely. So it's really evolved a lot over the last 30 years or so. Uh, when I joined the industry, industry assets had just gotten over a trillion dollars, and today they stand at just north of four trillion. Um, during the, the early part of the pandemic, there was a bit of a trough below three trillion, which made us all nervous, but it, it's really rebounded since then. In the last decade, it's, it's doubled in size. Uh, there's over 8,000 8, hedge funds globally, with the majority of those being in New York, followed by London, the West Coast, and Asia as well. Um, so basically main banking centers is, is where, where these funds have really grown up. Um, the interesting thing about the, uh, the industry is that 90% of the assets are controlled by 10% of the funds. Um, and that's really my focus client base is those, lar those larger funds um, who need financing and are seeking to grow their businesses. So household names, I'm sure many people on the line are familiar with. You know, Bridgewater, Two Sigma, D.E. Shaw, Elliott, Paulson, Citadel, Millennium. I mean, these names are, are in headlines with frequency. And uh, for better or for worse, many, many of those are my clients, which, is, again, is all publicly available information on their, on their Form ADD filings. Um, but it, it's a real pleasure to help them grow their businesses. And many of these managers I've known since their infancy. Um, it's been a really hard few years from a performance perspective. At the S&P 500 is just on fire and only two or three hedge funds uh, of, of the larger group that we track closely actually beat the S&P 500 in uh, 2021. So I'm hoping that this year is a better year for everybody. Uh, we used to joke in hedge fund research that the job of a hedge fund was to capture 80% of market upside and 20% of the downside. Now, if you can find a hedge fund that's done that over the last 10 years, uh, they're a winner and they're multi-billion dollars. Right, so is there a similar ratio in terms of you know, you said 90% of the hedge fund, only 10% of the hedge funds have 90% of the assets. So is there a similar sort of Pareto type rule when it comes to performance as well? Uh, that is the age old question. Yeah. Uh, many allocators believe, and we see in the numbers that the larger the hedge funds become, there tends to be more of a performance drop off. And there's arguments for that, sure. So I mean, some small cap managers where there's uh, capacity constraints tend to outperform, newer managers tend to outperform. 
Um, is it is it greed? Is it laziness? Is it size? Who knows? No two funds are exactly identical, so it's it's hard to hard to really say. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard. The last 10 years, we've seen a lot of funds who traditionally have managed more new, a market neutral style have moved to be longer biased to, to really take advantage of, of the growing markets. And likewise, we've seen a number of short only managers go out of business. So those are funds that are exclusively focused on short selling. And they've just had a really, really, really tough time in these, in these growing markets. Sure, sure, sure. And I, I assume, you know, in the past few years with the number of family offices growing you know that was a different segment also i don't know if that's particularly you, your client group but perhaps you have some insights there as well absolutely so I, I cover a number of family offices from this seat historically family offices are investing in hedge fund managers themselves and some are building out teams to really invest their own money uh, but they found most family offices find that you, you can get specific exposures uh, to different themes or different uh, parts of the capital structure uh, via hedge fund managers. Um, also following Archegos, which I'm sure everybody uh, saw in the headlines, right. the word family office in, in my world became a bit of a, uh, a bad word uh, in, in that um, we all saw what happened with, with that, that, that blow up and how it impacted the sell side and many of my competitors uh, within right. my brokerage. Right, so this sounds like a super complex industry that you're in a, a very tough but also fascinating job so for some of our students they probably wonder how did you get from your mba to this sort of industry and how did your classes and at pepperline prepare you for this kind of very fascinating but very complex job yeah you know it's it, it, when graduating in 2007 i never would have predicted that this was the exact direction i would go I was always enamored by the hedge fund industry and how little information was available. I think uh, in a future life, I'll come back as an investigative journalist because in many ways you have to use a lot of those same skills to do the job that I've done over the last decade well. Um, so starting in research, I mean, I met over 2000 hedge funds during my time at Wells Fargo Family Wealth. We were invested in approximately 20, 20, 20 to 25, depending on the, on the quarter. And I met so many people globally throughout that time period that when the sell side and the investment bank uh, came to me and said, hey, you've already been doing this capital introductions job. You've already been deeply immersed in the hedge fund ecosystem, helping hedge fund managers grow their business. Why don't you think about joining us? And in that moment, I said, all right, well, let's put your money, put your money where your mouth is. Let's talk about it. And I was curious the, the difference between working on the buy side and how much you could get paid there versus working on the sell side and how much you could get paid there. Obviously, there was, there was other trade-offs that came into the decision as well. But I was initially drawn by the faster pace and the economic incentives that came with moving into um, Prime Brokerage Group. Great. So uh, maybe just briefly, if you could explain the difference between buy and sell side, because I think a lot of our students aren't really that familiar with it. Sure. So in, in my world, the buy side really means two things. It's allocators of capital and it's also, it's also hedge funds. And then this, the sell side really is the investment bank uh, that I work at. Um, I'm on the public market side. So my clients are investing in post IPO securities across uh, equities and credit as well. And so basically we're, we're selling into the buy side in a way just to make it as simplistic as possible. Right, again, it all sounds very complex. So I'm curious, how did you land your first job? You know, coming out of graduate school, how did you get that first job? Yeah, great question. So. I grew up in the industry in a, in a way, my, my mother runs an RAA, registered investment advisor in, in the Bay Area. So I was always kind of drawn towards, towards finance. Uh, I started with her and said, hey, can I have a few informational interviews? And she put me in touch with a few people in her network, um, other MBA students actually at the time and, and recent MBA graduates and had informational interview after informational interview. And every single person I met actually really ramped up during the summer between first and second year at Pepperdine, every person I met, I asked for an introduction to two, three, four other people. And before I knew it, I had met with over 50 people. Maybe that number was even closer to 70 or 80. And it, I had counted at some point in a spreadsheet, but I met as many people as I possibly could and was very diligent with follow-ups and thank you notes and figuring out parts of my network that I could also introduce them to. Even today, I still keep in touch 
with probably about a third of those people that I met in 2006 during that summer and then during my second year in business school. And it's really turned into the most amazing part of my, my network that I know so many people across all of Wall Street. Excellent. So, I mean, for the benefit of the students again, uh, because many of our students are familiar with the term network, but they think of things like LinkedIn, they think of things like, you know, social media type networks. Maybe you can speak a little bit to the difference. What is the impact of meeting somebody in person, face to face, and how, how that's a very different connection from, you know, having a friend and, you know, whatever your favorite social media network is? Absolutely. Um, so I'm on LinkedIn, Instagram, and tiny bit on Facebook, and I, I use Twitter for reading. So I think there, there at all is, and I'm very findable. Uh, when I think about networking, I, and this is such a lame phrase, you guys, but yeah. my yeah. your network is your net worth. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it's, it's really genuine networking that I found is the most important. So meeting people in person, of course, pandemic dependent, that's more complicated. But I think now... This is really a massive opportunity. Even today in my role, I think about how many more people can I meet because we have this Zoom world where it's very normal to meet people over video conference. So I'm literally able to expand my network globally to everybody and really make connections in a way that I couldn't before because it'd be very abnormal, Clemens, for even you and I to hop on a FaceTime like we did in preparation for this. That just yes, not be yes. action. So I think, I think we have to flip the script a little bit and reframe and think about the pandemic as an opportunity to actually meet people face to face over the Zoom and FaceTime. Absolutely. Um, but what does networking mean? I think I think it's about adding value to each other's lives. I think people really remember how they feel after a conversation with you. If you can leave someone with this really positive vibe and good energy and be thoughtful about follow up and just to being really trusted advisors and, and confidently friends with people quickly, um, it just, it, the network grows like wildfire. And again, it's kind of, it's a, it's a skill that takes time. This is very obvious too, when people um, come to you and they're networking because they want a job. And I think, I think the best network you can do to find your next job or your next three jobs is to network while you have that first job or while you're in school. I mean, while you're in school, you can talk to literally anybody. And I really did capitalize on that. Yeah, I think some of our students really discount the fact that uh, we do have a huge network and many of them don't take advantage of that. So uh, because, you know, you're strapped for time. Some of us had a job when we went to grad school. And uh, so you're always strapped for time, running from one class to another, from one project to another. But uh, the importance of a network should not ever be underestimated. Like you said, it's uh, your net worth. Uh, mm -hmm. So I appreciate you confirming that. And then speaking of net worth, you know, a lot of us are obviously interested in, in a fair compensation, so to speak, you know, a good compensation, right? And coming out of school, you know, that first job may not be your best job and probably not your best paid job, but uh, maybe you can speak to us a little bit about negotiating a perhaps slightly better salary because that impacts your career trajectory as well in terms of compensation. It absolutely does. And I can only speak to finance because that's what I've been familiar with the last 15 years. Of course, my husband works in tech, but it's not exactly exactly an apples to apples at comparison. Um, I did a terrible job negotiating my first job, my, my first salary and bonus structure out of school. <laughs> a terrible job, a terrible job. And back in 2007, I know thing, things have, have changed now to be to be in students' favors and in people's favor after the Jerry Brown legislation around about employers not being able to ask about prior salary history. That is huge. That is the greatest news ever because it means employ, future employers have to give you the first offer. And so it's actually really fun to help mentor people in those conversations and compensation is something I'm very passionate about. I'm always happy to have conversations with anyone who's interested in how to negotiate for that first job. But really putting it out there and saying, you know, ex talented people cost money and expensive things co are, are expensive for a reason. You want high quality, hard workers, all of these things. Um, in my world, the higher you can start with the base salary or all in compensation, the better, because your year on year progress and getting paid is always a percentage. And naturally, women have made less than men. And I think a lar in large part, that's because using gender stereotypes, which I typically hate, uh, we do a worse job negotiating that first, that first 
uh, salary number. And then of course you're getting paid up 3%, 5%, 15%. But if you're working off a low cost basis, that really means nothing because you're up 10% year is probably less than a dollar number than your counterparts up 7% year. So I, I think it's important to really, really have the conversation. Um, Ray Dalio is a, bit, a big name in my business and he, pre he preaches radical transparency. And I think there's a certain level of transparency that people should feel comfortable having amongst their network. Mm -hmm. And even speaking about, hey, what, what's your first, what, what, what are you asking for? You're joining, you're joining an investment bank as a VP or as an associate. What makes sense? What is normal? And being able to be open about what you're making, what you expect to make, and also having people I actually found this to be really, really helpful. I find people who uh, have the job um, that I want, but rewind five years in their career. Mm -hmm. And I'm using this anecdotally. So I'm trying to get into Goldman Sachs as a vice president. I meet a director who's maybe a, three, a third or fourth year director. They were VP five years ago. Have a conversation with them over coffee. Hey, I'm really curious. What did you make in 2015? And that's Excellent. a really good starting point. Yeah. And of course, you can adjust it for city or, or inflation. I know CPI was 7%. It's another topic. But that is really a very, very, very valuable data point that I don't think people are um, feel empowered to ask. I mean, I'm happy to share my, my salary information from, from greater than five years ago. And if you're a friend, I'll tell you what I made. You know, have a bonus conversation today. I'm happy to share if you're a good friend of mine. I just think it's really important that we all aspire to get paid what we're worth and paid fairly. Excellent. Thank you so much. That makes so much sense. And then in terms of, you know, using the term DIA might be an appropriate term, um, you know, to, to appreciate value that you put in and being respected for that with the, with the appropriate compensation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and speaking of compensation, that is always a, effect, a factor in compensation might be your skill base, right? What do you know? Uh, and what are your skill levels? And, um, you know, reminds me, you know, what, what are these banks nowadays, what are investment banks and what are hedge funds looking for in terms of skills? What, if you had to hire somebody tomorrow, what type of person would you like to hire? What, what is, the, if there's a list of skills and tools that they need to bring to the table, what are they? Absolutely. So anybody can learn the math and anybody can read the history books and read press releases and, and, the education piece is a bit of a given, especially if you're if you're you get a resume and you see that someone has really consistently showed up, is aspiring, is goal oriented. At the end of the day, finance is a human system. Investment banking is a human system. Anybody can calculate performance in a spreadsheet or or, or track what hedge funds are doing around the world. But at the end of the day, hedge funds and prime brokerage groups and investment banks want people who have the social skills and the ability to really work hard and navigate internally and externally with ease. It really, it really is about a cultural fit rather than about the rogue education. Because if you think about it, people who are approaching hedge funds and banks typically have an interest in, uh, in finance. That's kind of a given. So as long as you can check, check that out. I mean, my, my boss today has an undergraduate degree um, from Vermont in philosophy. And he now oversees a gigantic balance sheet extending leverage to hedge funds. Um, and you know, ask him the same question. And through his network and through his interest in hedge funds in the space, he got into that role. So I think there's yeah. no, there's no, there's no necessary skill set per se. I think it's more about a culture, cultural fit, and more about the eagerness to really be in the business and really learn and dig in and work hard. Right. So in in terms of if, if I just wanted to narrow it down in terms of the language of skills, maybe communication skill is an important one, right? Uh, not so much a question of how fast can you calculate a discounted cash flow model, but rather, um, you know, how can you present it? How can you kind of convince your, your, your clients or your boss or your teammates um, that you are on the right track? Absolutely. And I think the other thing that's worth mentioning is the environment that I work in is on a trading floor. And it's, it's very, very fast paced there. And of course, during non-COVID times, right? It's very fast paced. There's, there's not a lot of privacy. Uh, you set three feet from your, your partner next to you and six feet across from someone and you're in there tight and it's loud and it's energetic. And there's a lot of banter and no one has any secrets. Everybody knows literally 
everything about each other all the time because you're on the desk for 12 hours a day working in this really stressful, high paced environment. Um, so I think that that's part, that's part of the job too that really takes a lot of people by surprise. If you need quiet and a closed door to, to read and absorb information and even to have a, a conversation on the phone, it's probably not the right business for you. You have to be, all of us in this business are a little bit adrenaline addicted in a way and also um, really get energy from being around other people. Yeah, so I, I ran a trading for myself many, many years ago in London. And uh, I remember part of the reason perhaps why women aren't so much in the trading floor arena is it's a very rough kind of macho chauvinistic, I'm sorry to use these terms, but uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a male driven and foul language sometimes uh, you know, environment that's not very ladylike sometimes. Um, <laughs> and and sure. I, I wonder because in my experience, some of the best traders, investors I've met are women. Um, yeah. and, and it's an uphill battle for them. Maybe you can speak a little bit about your experience as a woman in this very strange male-driven industry. Sure. So I'm probably a little bit, a little bit different than most, but the women, the women who have persisted and remain in the business were all pretty similar in a few ways. Um, the, the main thing that unites us all is that we are fearless and we also tend to operate in a gender neutral way. We of course use our, our assets to our advantage when that makes sense. So getting a conversation with anybody, um, closing business in a way where you can do it in a more kind of feminine, traditionally feminine, softer way that, that can come across better. But I've had great female partners, male partners, and it's really when you're trying when you're trying to win new business, and you know I'm very much in, in sales, as you might be able to kind of garner from, from this conversation so far. Uh, you figure out what resonates with the the prospect the best, and is that is that me as a 38 year old woman, or is it my colleague who's you know 55 years old with some gray hair and a man because the client's more receptive of that? There definitely is a sea change that's been been coming and has happened over the last 10 to 15 years in our business where there's a lot more diversity, there's more women, there's younger people. It really, the hedge fund business has evolved in a way where it's no longer just your um, you know, gray haired man in his fifties selling prime, prime broker sales and selling hedge fund financing or working at hedge funds. So it's evolved. I think the other thing worth mentioning too is uh, in, in my private life, which I don't really talk a lot about, so bear with me. I, I ride horses competitively uh, at the Grand Prix level. It is a sport where you are competing against men, women, 16 year olds, 65 year olds, professionals, amateurs, everybody. And it really is made, made the best horse rider combination win. If any of you are, all, are, are bored or wanting to multitask right now, go into YouTube and you can type in Lindsay Costigan and you'll see a bunch of my, my show jumping videos. So, so for me, I, I, I take the skills and poise that I've learned from, from that sport and have really parlayed that into how I act and react on the trading floor, and also how I, I sell, how I'm not afraid to have hard conversations, how I'm not afraid to make the ask for new business. And that for me really um, is a genderless, a genderless thing for sure. I love that. Um, you know, having kids myself, you know, I always preach to my kids, when you're young, you ought to be fearless. And, and, and I was fearless in my own youth because I was probably dumb and naive and didn't know, and I was just going for it. Uh, maybe that helps, uh, you know, drive you the energy level forward and, and just be fearless. I love that. I love that idea. Um, but switching gears just a tiny bit, you know, having heard all this, uh, where do you see the future of specifically your industry, hedge funds, but banking in general? Because there's about a sea change that that's hitting us in the crypto space, blockchain space and so forth. And uh, can you speak a little bit, where do you see the next five years or so in, in your particular industry? Absolutely. And, and I love that you brought up crypto, DeFi, Web3. I think it's all really, really important and timely. And we, have to, we ask the question internally to senior management every single week, when are we going to get into the Bitcoin financing business? We'll start with Bitcoin and we can branch out into altcoins or do more in blockchain. We have to. And every bank is feeling that same amount of pressure. Um, from a regulatory perspective, there's still many trying to get their arms around it. So I think it's on the horizon. It's coming. I'm sure, I'm sure many of you saw the press release that Sequoia Heritage and Paradigm just invested in Citadel Securities. And that, in large part, is a big push towards DeFi. 
and towards crypto investing and trading. And now if Citadel is going to come meaningfully into the crypto space, that is so exciting. It's so, so huge. And there's other, there's other industry participants, household names that are also meaningfully getting into that space. So I, I think it's not, it's not, it's not if, it's when all of the big banks uh, take notice and really start, start doing more there. I think also there's an interesting article uh, recently on Goldman bankers being dissatisfied this year with their bonuses, even though many had a banner year. And in large parts is because they, they viewed their, their pay as relative to some of these crypto kids who are you know in their early to mid to late 20s who invested in ETH at 20 cents or got in you know a Bitcoin in 2015 and now effectively could retire. Um, so I, I think it's, they're still, I mean, we're in the first inning with, with crypto. I'm really enthused by it. In fact, at the, at the Milken conference back in October, which fortunately was that little COVID dip where we could all see each other in person. I had dinner with uh, the CEO of America's for BNP Paribas, a small group dinner. And we spent over an hour talking about the opportunity um, with, with, with altcoins and Bitcoin and, and moving towards crypto broadly. And now we're kind of in a book club sharing articles. So I think, I think it's not, it's again, it's not if it's when, and I, I think that if I'm encouraging anybody who's listening to me right now, if he wants to get into finance, really looking hard at the web three DeFi space. I might not go so, so far as to say dive into NFTs. I'm still getting my arms around that. I think it's interesting. Uh, but but I think that um, Bitcoin as a store of value is real. It's here to stay. It's 20% of the gold float. Um, the, the numbers really do speak for themselves when, when you look under the hood to see to see what's what's happening in that space. All right. As, aside from the crypto and DeFi space, do you see anything else that's upon the horizon or something that we may not be aware of? If we can share that, if that's at all possible. Yeah, I mean, thematically we're witnessing a huge move um, from more public market investments into venture. And there's been a huge amount of money that's gone in that, in that direction. Um, venture SPACs are big. I'm sure everyone sees the headlines on that. So I, I think, I think thematically it's not that long short equity is going out of vogue. I think it'll take a very long time before hedge funds are marginalized in the asset allocation plans that many large allocators have, which are really kind of driving interest in the space. Um, but I think, I think investors are really looking for diversified alpha in their portfolio and how do you get that, especially in when you look at what the S&P 500 has done over the last 10 years. Um, lo longer term, lower vol, higher returning strategies are really, really, really needed, hence that shift towards, towards private markets. Right. And, and obviously, if you're not in the public markets, you don't have to have that minute by minute uh, change in market value that... Yes. Um, you know, helps a little bit sleeping a little better at night, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. I have a few um, questions from the students already. Um, maybe we can pick up one of them. Um, Mike Cashin is asking, what are your thoughts about switching jobs every two to three years early in your career in order to expedite a title race? Um, first of all, hi, Mikey. Uh, thank you for the question. I appreciate that. Uh, it's become more commonplace today. It really has, especially I think po post Jerry Brown legislation around compensation, um, perhaps it'll change. People can stay in jobs for longer, but I think right out of school, the, the, first, the first point of entry into the workforce is super important. And you might get in there and you realize, hey, this, this isn't for me. I think, I think every move um, can be explained as long as there's a good story around it. And advising people in job changes myself, I say you're either running, to make it very simple, you're either running towards something or you're running away from something. Ideally, you're never running away from a bad situation, but you're always kind of being a little bit opportunistic about what could be out there for you, what could be next. And having conversations when, with future employers when you are already employed is so much, so much easier to have. Um, I think putting a number on the table early to say, hey, I'm really, really happy where I am, you know, parentheses, even if you're just kind of moderately happy and being, being, being willing to go and have those conversations. I, I say this to my boss too. I've never said no to a job interview. I take 100% of job interviews because typically what I do is I end up having the conversation and, and sending over 10 candidate ideas into that job. So do free recruiting effectively. And some of those uh, some of those interviews that I went on have turned in, turned into additional additional jobs for me, but I think I think as long as it's explainable, um, moving every two to three years 
a few times is completely okay. I wouldn't do it more than three times, let's say, um, but two to three times to really figure out what it is you want to be doing is completely understandable. Again, as long as there's a good story around it. Right. And I, I suppose one, one of the side stories might be, what is the trajectory? If you're, you know, moving two to three years and it's not an upward position, uh, that's also questionable, right? That's right. Unless you're changing industries. You know, I think it's okay Unless to make a lateral industries. move. Yeah. Yeah. So, and of course, too, like if you're making a lateral move and it's something you're really interested in, having pay parity as you move is excellent. If you're moving into an industry that's arguably riskier than the one you're in, you want to get paid for that move because it could be a two-year trade because it's not your choice because they go out of business or they get bought or there's a reorg. So I think you have to really, it's, it's not an exact mathematical equation, but absolutely something to consider. Um, Most finance students wouldn't, wouldn't know the risk return question that we all have, right? Yeah. It's the risk versus the return. It's the same for the job as well. Um, uh, maybe one more question. Joe is asking, would you say getting Kaya is worth if you're looking to start your own alternative investment fund? And then connected to that, um, uh, Corey is asking, what made you decide to pursue the Kaya designation versus any other designations like CFA? Absolutely. So um, a fun filled fact, my mother was the first female president of the CFA Society of San Francisco when she was pregnant with me in the early 80s. Got indoctrinated. Yeah. Exactly. So I was like, all right, you know what? I'm going to go for the CFA. You guys, I failed level one. I studied so hard. I studied so hard. I literally, my six months of my life, I will never get back from studying for the CFA. And I narrowly failed. I narrowly failed. I mean, it was, it was one percentage point effectively that, that kept me from, from passing level one. And in that moment, I'm, I'm also not a great test taker, arguably. I decided, I decided to press pause on that, try, try to focus really more on um, the learning that I'm getting from doing the job. And that eventually, in that probably six months after I failed level one, I moved into alternatives research from hedge fund re- or from, um, from long only research. And Kaya really made more sense for me personally, just being in alts research, it was, it was the way to go. One of my mentors early on said to me, um, get, getting the CFA is like leaving from Los Angeles and, and backpacking all the way to Beijing. Whereas the Kaya, it's kind of like, I don't know, maybe driving across the country to New York from LA. Um, but it's a little bit, little bit easier. In fact, it was, it was a lot easier. I was also a lot more focused and a lot more applicable to, to my role in, in alternatives. Excellent. So maybe you can switch gears a little bit again. So do um, you have a family? You said you like horseback riding competitively. I've seen the videos. It's, it's insane. I would never jump on a horse like that, but uh, kudos to you. Um, Thank you. Maybe you can tell us, you know, given your very, very demanding job, um, how do you manage this with the family yeah. and, and with your probably also demanding hobby? Um, yeah. Is, is there a balance in there? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I have tried to rewrite the script as far as work-life balance feels so cliche. And for me, it really is balancing. I think about it as a verb because some days it's all horses, some days it's all career, and some days it's all family. And I think within each of those things, you can see um, it, I'm wearing triangle earrings just ha- happenstance today, but I, the triangle is the strongest geometrical shape. And I think about my life as those three things being very much my strength and also in balance with one another. So work, career, or sorry, work and career, horses, and what I do for myself, and then also my family being kind of the third, third point of the triangle. And within each of those buckets, there's a certain amount of balancing that goes on as well. Um, which I could, I could speak more about, but I think it really, it comes down to finding that balance every day and having it be a unique balance and also know that every day is a new day and you shouldn't judge yourself uh, based on, hey, today I spent the entire day exercising and practicing my sport and, and doing something horse oriented. There's no guilt around that. I think as, as an ancillary add-on, uh, one thing that's enabled me to, to create that kind of ongoing balance or balancing is outsourcing everything I can. And for me, that's a real basic mathematical equation. If on a take-home pay basis, I think about what am I worth per hour? Mm-hmm. If I can pay someone to do something that, that I'm paying them less than I'm making on a per hour basis, they're doing it. 
So I'm, I'm and I borrowed that from another exec, executive uh, friend of mine. And I, I've moved to, to a model of outsourcing as much as I possibly can and only really focusing on the things that are adding value to me uh, and, and my life. Hey, wonderful. So uh, quite a related question from uh, Andy Lee here. He's saying, if you weren't working in finance, what do you think you would be doing now? Um, hello, Andy. I think, I think it depends on uh, how many dollars are in my piggy bank as far as what I would be doing. Um, <laughs> More and more, and this, this sounds so a little bit kind of cliche, but I've, I've been trying to do more, more investments in my own personal portfolio. So looking at um, making angel and venture investments into uh, companies that I believe in that are focused on sustainability and, and impact and have a unique niche. And then also kind of building up my network uh, on the angel and venture investing side of things. Um, likewise, I've also been trying to network more um, in the crypto world and meet a lot of interesting people there. So I think if, if I could win the lottery, um, I would absolutely just focus on on helping people build their businesses, but within a different part of the finance ecosystem. So then actually direct investments, direct companies, crypto, things that are not, not necessarily hedge fund oriented. But I, I feel so lucky. I do. I get to wake up every single day and do a job that I love surrounded by clients and colleagues that I think the absolute world of. And if, if you follow me on Instagram, you'll see I've got um, hashtag prime brokerage diaries or hashtag kept intro diaries um, where I'll, I'll, I'll put that hashtag just when I'm having a little bit of fun in, in, in my role because it is uh, it's not all challenging it's not all you know at the desk hustle on the trading floor um, a lot of it is really fun and I've been able to create this role for myself where there's um, a certain kind of elegance and leisure and fine dining and jet setting that goes on and that's I have to pinch myself some days that that is part of my job is, is, is to wine and dine and make friends with people. I mean, my, my six-year-old son says, wait, your job's to make friends? I'm like, well, kind of, in a way, in a way it is. So it's, I, know I definitely underestimated how, how much fun um, this, this role was, was going to be for me. Maybe one more uh, student question here. What would you suggest for someone who wants to build their resume while changing industry into investment banking? Ooh, I think there's an interesting play and I'd have to look at the exact resume and, and DM me afterwards. Um, I think if you want to get into investment banking, focusing on the, the part of the world that you've already uh, worked in would be huge. So if you've been at a tech company working in software, how do you parlay that into working in an investment bank, um, focusing on, on tech oriented managers or companies? Um, I think it really depends. I think, I think there is a way, there is a way to, to translate the skill set. And also using your MBA as a pivot point absolutely is helpful. Um, or or fi finding your way into industries, knowing that, hey, on that compensation scheme we talked about, to change industries and make a full pivot, you might be taking a step back, but knowing that there's more upside in the future. All right. So speaking of MBA, what was your favorite MBA class? The negotiations class. Wow. Loved it. Do you remember it. the professor? Oh gosh, I can see his face. I can see his face, but it was it was a joint class with the law school, and I use what I learned in that class every single day. Wonderful. <laughs> yes, every single day I think about it. That's great. That's so nice to hear because I always think that you know we remember coming from an MBA or from a from a graduate education, we remember certain classes better than others, and and I always wonder what of my class sticks with the student what particular mm -hmm. class session or subject sticks with the student that they can actually use day to day in their in their career right so that that's mm -hmm. wonderful great um maybe on a lighter note also um favorite restaurant you lived in malibu or around malibu <laughs> and did you have a favorite restaurant there i did absolutely so uh i i lived on pch for the duration of my two years at pepperdine and i frequented um, Dukes with regularity, and also I will say, and many of you will appreciate this on the on the line if you are older school Malibu, but the old Nobu had to have been my top three favorite restaurants of all of all time. I mean, the new one's pretty good too, but the old the old Nobu, Nobu in uh, the Malibu Country Mart was pretty amazing. Wonderful, and and so can we assume that sushi is one of your favorite foods? Sushi is one of my favorite foods, and I think I think I would be um, neglecting an important part of my life to a. Uh, to not share that Q's and Cabo Cantina and, and Westwood also were a place I frequented 15 years ago. No judgment, no judgment. 
Um, do you prefer coffee or tea? And how would you like your coffee? Uh, Americano with cream. Oh, nice. I haven't tried that one. Um, is it heels or flats? Right now it's slippers, I must say. <laughs> a good pair of high heels can get you through any work day. So let's go to one more serious question from Matt Burkhardt. He said, you mentioned very few hedge funds outperformed the S&P this year or last year, but their expectation is that the change is going forward. When the advantage does switch back to institutional investing, do you anticipate a large correction in the S&P broader market? Or do you think hedge funds will offer superior returns by pioneering alternative investments like crypto specs while the market stays elevated? Um, Next question. <laughs> I can't, I wish I had a crystal ball because we could all make a lot of money here together right now. Um, I do not. I think hedge funds as an asset class will continue to be a part of an overall asset allocation and part of an overall portfolio. Um, putting up high teens annualized returns used to look really sexy and interesting. Everything's relative, like the Goldman, Bank, Goldman Banker uh, comp comparison from earlier. If you're looking at these crypto funds that have put up you know, 300, 400, 500% last year versus your hedge fund that put up 17% you know, net of fees, it's, it's a hard comparison. So I think the purpose of hedge funds is going to change in portfolios where now they're viewed today as a more stable part of the portfolio. Whereas 20 years ago, it's, it was like the wild, wild west considering investing in hedge funds. So I think there's always a place, but now they're just viewed a little bit differently. Um, I also think that there's going to be a sea change as it pertains to where investors, where institutional allocators are looking for, um, for yield. Credit markets have really, really struggled. We saw Anchorage go out of business uh, a few weeks back. Um, you know, it's been really, it's been really chal challenged from a performance perspective and the credit ecosystem. I believe that there will be more and more allocators finding yield uh, in some of these crypto strategies. So in, in yield farming or staking, where a low risk in crypto land uh, yielding strategy will get you between 15 and 20% um, and a higher higher yield crypto strategy will get you will get you twice that. In fact, there's a, there's a company in Los Angeles called Wave Financial uh, that has a number of these treasury type solutions um, for both crypto corporates and also, um, institutional investors. And they say that they do it, they do it very, very well. And they're trying to bridge that gap between, um, what institutional investors want, but then also, um, the return profile that, uh, people really are seeking in crypto. We know Wave Financial very well because Tom Lombardi, um, used to work there and he's teaching our digital asset classes. I Everybody. love that. Very cool. Yeah, so we're kind of on the ball with things. That's great. Um, maybe one last question. This is just maybe out of personal interest. I, I've seen over the years how pension funds actually have drastically changed their MO. Um, do you see, given the need for higher returns for pension funds and, and you know, meeting the outgoing payments, people don't die fast enough, unfortunately. I hate to say that that way, but um, <laughs> do you see that eventually is a pension fund going to be a hedge fund? Because they're already using some hedge fund type strategies and they do have some allocations. Yes, I think, I mean, it's, I think it's a longer conversation on the legal structure of some yeah, of these institutional sure. allocators that are set up in a way such that they can get better uh, coverage, better research, better financing, better trading, all of that better rehab application. So maybe, I mean, I, th I think when you think about pensions, their assets are really guided, many of them, by the largest consultants in the world. Um, so the, the Cambridges, Axias, NEPCs, um, in the laundry list of, of, of folks in that space. And we joke that it's like turning the Titanic to change that asset allocation. It is really, 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 really challenging. Um, so will they become hedge funds? No, I doubt it. There will always be a delineation. And I believe that pensions will always also have the need to use consultants, more of a CYA exercise, to be frank. Um, you need the second set of eyes in the investment piece. You need the second set of eyes in the operational due diligence piece. So I, I, I think they'll always stay standalone. OK. And uh, one very last question from Corey. With the progression of Bitcoin, blockchains, and the crypto, do you assume any huge regulatory ethics and slash ethics changes in the industry 
since most, if not all, is decentralized? Oh, I think regulatory is very different from ethics changes. Sure. Um, I think fundamentally greed does drive a lot of um, people's motivations in, in finance and being in finance. Uh, I think a lot of people who have made the move to to DeFi are are doing so because they want to put you know put their middle finger up to the man for lack of a better way of saying that. So there definitely is a a gap that needs to be bridged between the two worlds. Um, the CEO of Ripple uh, spoke at a conference I went to recently, and he said he made a very salient point, and he said. The, it's a misnomer that we have no regulation in this space. And he went on to list six different regulatory bodies that have oversight into Ripple that he reports to daily, you know, weekly, if not daily. And I thought that was really eye-opening that there already is a lot of oversight and, and regulation. Um, another point that was made uh, at that same conference was that do you guys remember when, when Uber, when government stepped in and was trying to regulate Uber? Um, at some point, it had it become a, too big to regulate in the way that the government wanted to regulate it. Uh, crypto assets now have a market cap of north of north of two trillion, and peaked close to two three trillion when Bitcoin got up to what sixty six or whatever it was recently. Um, a similar, they 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 use the, the Uber analogy as as a way or a, a, as analogous to what's happening in crypto. Um, too big to regulate sounds a bit scary, but it's too big to regulate in the way that these regulatory bodies have historically regulated other industries. So there needs to be a bit of an evolution from the regulatory bodies and a bit of an education for them to actually have oversight in a way that makes sense. Total sense to me. Um, I don't know how we're doing on time, but do you have any closing comments, any recommendations you wanna to give to our fellow students here, fellow Pepperdine alums? Oh, you're putting me on the spot. Um, yes, I mean, I, I think I, I think about this um, daily. Something that I that I one of the tenets I live by uh, involves kind of how how do I think about kind of happiness, and I, I jokingly call it microdosing. Um, I think you know not mushrooms, but more microdosing on happiness. I think the mushroom talk is for a different a different forum. Um, oh, come on, Clem, it's not even like a little smile. No. <laughs> All right, so. Here's what I wanted to say. I think it's really, really, really important to invest in yourself and invest in your happiness. Um, I have an executive coach that help me, helps me look within and look forward. I have a therapist that helps me look within and look backwards. And I've got a personal board of directors um, that I've accumulated over my life and in my relationships um, that I really lean on. And I think those, all of those things really kind of add to my happiness and add to my ability to do my job um, well, I also am incredibly aware of the stories that I tell myself, and I think everyone here can agree it's been challenging throughout the pandemic, but all of us need to, to be easy on yourself and really remind yourself of how great you are and give yourself positive feedback on the back of every call or interaction um, and just really kind of microdose with positivity as, as often as you can. And, and part of that too is, is finding ways to give back. I call it tithing. Um, and this was an idea that actually I stole from my, my uh, executive coach, where you take a certain percentage of your take home pay and you and you give it out and it could be in the form of an outsized tip or taking your nurse friends or teacher friends for, for dinner or sending pizza to their house during the pandemic. Um, or even just giving back with your time. So for me that that's finding um, other juniors within the space within finance, finding people who want to make or people find me who want to make a shift into finance and me really spending time with them in a way that is giving back. And it tends to come, come around, you know, 10, 20, 30 fold. It really is the, the age old adage of um, give and you shall receive. And I really try to try to live by that uh, every single day. And also too bringing, there's now on the sea change point, there's now a different thing that's happened in our world in the last few years, especially where it's, it's actually kind of okay now to bring your whole self to work. There's no, there's no longer this, you know, take off the mask when you get home and put it on before you go in. Um, everyone's heard, you know, people's children crying and dogs barking. And it might be the, the bright spot of the pandemic is that we all really do know each other a lot better. And we have a forum to be kind of more, more, more vulnerable with one another and therefore, um, you know, have more empathy for, for humanity broadly. Wonderful. Um, 
I don't have anything else to ask. Um, so I don't see any additional questions from uh, the students here. Um, so thank you so much, Lindsay. It's been wonderful. It's been a learning curve for me. I've learned a couple of new things. Um, I love many of the ideas that you portrayed, including you know thinking about yourself, you know being positive, um, especially in this day and age. It's so so important for us to to do that um, and and to give back. Um, uh, I can tell from my own experience that um, you never have the same positive feeling. You know, getting a paycheck is important, it's great, but the feeling from that is not the same as giving something back, you know, or, or helping somebody, or lend, lending a helping hand, even if it's just a gesture, um, mm -hmm. that the feeling is much more rewarding than, you know, receiving that paycheck. So thank you again, uh, it's Absolutely. been wonderful. Uh, let me see if there's mm -hmm. one last minute question here. Um, Oh, that's a good question. Amelia is asking, when will you visit Pepperdine next? Oh, I would love to come visit Pepperdine. Well, here's an open invitation. Anytime, Thank you. let us know. Um, we'll have coffee, we'll have lunch, and we'll introduce you to the students in person. I would love that. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you so much.